it's March 16, 2021. I'm Todd Dunn, and today I want to talk about home solar power. Yep, what I want to talk about is this stuff. Solar panels on the roof or on a rack somewhere on your property and powering your house with it. Now there are two ways you can go with home solar power. One is uh, to go with what's called grid tie, where you have uh, solar panels, usually with microinverters, and you remain connected to the grid, except for a circuit that uh, disconnects you from the grid should the grid power go out, and at which point uh, you have no power. The other way to go is off-grid, in which you have a solar array that provides all the power you consume, but because solar arrays don't work very well at night, you also have to have batteries to get you through the night. Consequently, a grid tie setup is quite a bit cheaper than an off-grid setup. So what I'm going to do is just kind of go through and look at uh, some of the aspects of planning a system and pricing one out for different locations in the country to determine if home solar makes financial sense. So let's take a look at some numbers. For home solar, there are two basic types of systems. There's what's called a grid tie system and an off-grid system. In a, with a grid tie system, you're still connected to the electrical grid. The system is sized to match annual solar electric production to annual electrical consumption. It relies on the grid to provide power at night or during bad weather when you're not producing much solar energy. And the other aspect of it is that when the power grid goes down during a power outage, you don't have any power either. The basis of a grid tie system is that when your solar system is producing more power than you're consuming, that power goes back into the grid and creates a credit for you that you can use at night, for example, when you're not producing power. With an off-grid system, you are not connected to the grid. So you're completely independent of the grid. So if the power goes off around you, it doesn't affect you at all. Your system provides all of your power. The system is sized based on your worst month for solar production. That's usually December. So you'll size the system to produce enough power in December and uh, you will in general produce more power than you need in the summer, but you don't get any credit for that. The system relies on having a battery backup for night use and for bad weather where you don't produce very much solar. And uh, the one of the big costs in an off-grid system is the battery backup. Also, this typically the size in terms of the solar array in an off-grid system is larger than it is for a grid tie system because it's sized, as I said, for your worst month for solar production, not for annual production. The data required to assess the economic viability of a solar system is a little different for a grid tie system versus an off-grid system. For a grid tie system, we need to know annual power consumption to size the system. We need to know annual electrical cost to calculate the payback period. We need to know the location of the home, and that is basically north-south location. And we need to know the physical details of the solar installation. Which way will it be facing? What's the slope of the panels? etc. For an off-grid system, we need to know the power consumption for the worst power production month, that's usually December. We need to know the annual electricity cost, again to calculate the payback period, and 
like with the grid tie system, the physical location of the house, and any physical details of the solar installation. Now what I'm going to do is some example assessments of the economic viability of grid tie and off-grid solar systems for five different locations in the United States. Now I'm going to be using a sort of optimum uh, solar system, south facing, etc. Uh, for every location, but uh, I'm going. I've chosen the locations to illustrate some of the other factors that impact solar production. Those are your location, north or south. You get tend to get lower annual solar production the farther north you are, and it's particularly lower in the winter, and higher annual solar production as you go south. And also weather affects solar production. So I've chosen Bellingham, Washington as a location that is notoriously cloudy and rainy for a large part of the year. And as a contrast, Phoenix, Arizona, which is a location much further south than Bellingham, but also one of the sunniest places in the United States. And for a couple of other comparisons, Kansas City, Missouri, which is pretty close to the geographic center of the United States, Bangor, Maine in the northeast part of the United States, and Miami, Florida in the southeast part. Now these locations will show the effects of weather and uh, north or south location. And what I've done for this comparison is I went again to the U.S. Energy Information Agency webpage and I pulled out average residential electrical energy usage uh, per month for each of these locations. And you can see they're all pretty comparable except for Bangor, Maine. And the reason Bangor, Maine is lower is uh, twofold. One, in Maine, very little heating is done with electricity and most homes don't have air conditioning. And that causes much lower uh, electric consumption, which, as we'll see, impacts uh, the cost of a system. And then I looked up the average cost of electricity in each of these locations and then used the average electric consumption and the cost to calculate annual cost. And this annual cost will be used to calculate the payback time for a solar electric system. I'm going to start my uh, examples with the grid tie systems. And the first thing we're going to do is, again, take the data, which I've converted into kilowatt hours of energy per year that's consumed. And we want to size our solar system to produce that much energy. So in order to do that, we need to know one thing how many solar hours per year are there in each location. Fortunately, the federal government's National Renewable Energy Lab has created a very useful website that will take a location, solar panel orientation, and weather at that location into account to calculate the number of solar hours per year. Once you have that number, you can simply divide the number of kilowatt hours required by the number of solar hours per year, and that'll tell you the minimum size for your solar array in kilowatts. And I've done that for the power required for each of the five locations, calculated use the website to calculate the uh, solar hours per year, which you can see range from a low of 1,065 in Bellingham, Washington, because it's far north and cloudy, to a high of 1,707 solar hours per year in Phoenix, Arizona, where it's mostly always sunny. And we can then divide power that we need to produce, which is power consumed, by solar hours and get solar array sizes. You can see they range from a low of 5.1 kilowatts for Bangor, Maine, 
which is largely a function of the small amount of energy we need there, to a high of 11.7 kilowatts of solar for Bellingham, Washington. So that gives us our solar array size. Now that we know the required solar array sizes, all we have to do is calculate the system cost. I again went online and looked up average grid tie solar cost per watt of installed solar for each of the five locations. The cost ranged from a low of 245 a watt in Phoenix to a high of 308 in Kansas City, Missouri. I simply multiplied the cost per watt by the system size to get system cost. And you can see there's quite a wide range for these five locations from a low of 14,600 ish for Bangor, Maine up to 29,100 ish for Bellingham, Washington. Then taking the normal cost of electricity if they were on grid all year, and dividing system cost by electrical uh, use cost, we get payback time in years. And you can see that uh, in Phoenix, as expected, since it's really sunny there, the payback time is the shortest at 11.8 years. Then it goes up for Bangor, Maine and Miami, Florida to around 14 years, and then jumps way up for Kansas City and Bellingham, where it's around 24 years. Now, each individual would have to decide whether or not this payback time was acceptable to them in terms of uh, making the system economically viable. Now, I would suggest that for most people, a 24-year payback time probably means that the system isn't really economically viable. Uh, also, because that's getting close to the expected lifetime of some of the components, so you may have to replace components before you get to payback in places like Bellingham, where it's very cloudy, or Kansas City, where the cost of installation is high and which pushes, pushes up your system cost. So these are some good estimates, I think. Now, these estimates do not include the current federal tax credit of 22% of system cost. And the reason for that is that is a non-refundable tax credit. So if you don't pay enough income tax to collect your credit, you don't get the credit. So each person will get possibly a variable amount of credit. So I have left that out of the calculation. Now let's take a look at the off-grid systems. Now the big difference between grid tie and off-grid is grid tie systems have a solar array that's sized to produce the required annual energy uh, consumption over the course of the year, and it relies on the grid for any imbalance. But the idea is if you produce as much energy as you use in a year, uh, credits from your power company for overproduction will offset periods when you uh, are underproducing. And an off-grid system doesn't work that way because you're not connected to the grid and you cannot rely on the grid for anything. So what you have to do is size the solar system for your worst month of production. That is usually December when the days are the shortest. So what I've done is I've gone back to the National uh, Renewable Energy Lab website and I've calculated with that website the minimum number of solar hours for the year for any given month. In this case, it was always December. And then I have used that and the, and this is a daily number, and I've used that along with the average kilowatts required per day for each of the locations to calculate the solar array size. And again, this is the minimum solar array size. Now, if you look at these, you can see they're a bit different than before. 
Uh, in Bellingham, Washington, we now need a 33 kilowatt array. Uh, Phoenix isn't that different. We now need a 10 kilowatt array, 14 kilowatt array in uh, Kansas City, a 9.4 kilowatt array in Bangor, and a 9.7 kilowatt away, array in Florida. Bangor is uh, the smallest here simply because uh, in Bangor, Maine, our power consumption is the lowest. Well, now that we've sized our off-grid solar arrays, we can use the information on how much it costs to uh, build an array to calculate the array cost. But we have to add one other factor to that. An off-grid system doesn't produce any power at night or and produces very little power on cloudy, rainy, or snowy days. Consequently, the system requires a backup battery to provide power overnight and also to uh, provide power during periods of low solar energy production. And I have used for the batteries uh, an assumption that we're going to have to provide enough power to get through one day and uh, with no sun. And I have uh, used the Tesla Powerwall uh, as the battery because it is just about the cheapest battery per kilowatt that is currently available and used that price to determine battery cost. And for every place but Bangor, Maine, battery backup for these systems requires three Tesla power walls. And these are my estimates of the cost of the Tesla power walls. In Bangor, Maine, we only require two, and I've put in an estimate for two Tesla power walls. So system cost is the cost of the solar array, uh, inverter, etc and backup batteries. You can see for Bellingham, it's pretty extreme, $110,000. Using the annual cost of electricity, that gives a 90-year payback. That is much longer than the expected life of the components, so that certainly is not financially viable. In Phoenix, an off-grid system has costs $52,000 and has a 33-year payback. That is probably not viable because we would most likely have to replace the batteries before that. Similarly, Kansas City has a 59-year payback for the $71,000 system cost. Uh, Bangor is the cheapest, $46,000, but 43-year payback. And finally, Miami at $54,000, 34 year payback. Basically, what this says is that an off grid solar system really isn't economically viable because you will never pay back the cost of the system with savings of electric power costs from the grid before system components have to be replaced. Now, in the calculations, I did uh, so far, I have uh, used averages and I've ignored the physical details of the solar array installation on the home. So I thought I'd give an example of a particular house and the only one I have good data for is my house. So let's look at the numbers. My house uh, is very low average power consumption, only 2,270 kilowatts a year. Uh, my total annual electric bills run $420 a year. Uh, my worst solar month, which is December, I have 1.1 effective hours of sun a day. And my annual solar hours, again, calculated with the uh, National Renewable Energy Lab website was 1,030. So if I size a grid tie solar system, 
and shows I can get by with a 2.2 kilowatt system, which is pretty small and relatively cheap. For an off-grid system, I have to use my worst month and that and my power consumption during that month. Uh, and uh, basically that works out that I need to use a 7.3 kilowatt array. Now that's going to be way overkill in the summer, but I'll have to have it to get by in uh, the winter for an off-grid system. Now, and if I'm going off-grid, I'm going to need, because my max, my typical power consumption in the winter is about 8 kilowatts a day, uh, I'm going to need an 8 kilowatt at least battery uh, for a backup. Now, how much will a grid tie system cost? In my case, about $6,300. Payback time, 15 years. If I was younger, I would say, yeah, that's worth it. I can go grid tie and pay the system off in 15 years and essentially have no electric bills after that. What about off-grid? Well, because I have to buy a, a very expensive battery and put in a much bigger array, it's going to cost about $31,500. Payback time is 75 years. Well, I'll be 150 years old before that's paid back. So for me, that does not make economic sense. So these are examples of uh, how you can determine the financial viability of a home solar electric system. And I would say, based on these examples, that if you live in the sunny part of the country, preferably further south, there's a good chance that uh, you'll get payback in you know, 10 to 15 years uh, on a grid tie system, and it probably is worth it if you intend to be in the house that long. On the other hand, if you're thinking off-grid, well, in almost every case, it's not a financially viable choice. The only reason to do it is if you personally really want to be off-grid and the cost isn't a factor to you. Okay, I hope that uh, this uh, has been interesting and has illustrated some of the costs involved and some of the methodology in sizing a home solar system. If you liked it, please give me a thumbs up. If you haven't, please subscribe to my channel and don't forget to click that notification bell. Thanks for watching.